Good morning, everyone, um, or good afternoon, depending on where you are dialing in from. Um, I see that we've got quite a number of participants, both from Singapore as well as those joining us from the continent as well. My name is Bridget. I'm the Regional Group Director from Enterprise Singapore's office in Johannesburg. And really thank you all for joining us today for our Transport and Logistic Technology Opportunities webinar in Africa today. This is part of the Africa Singapore Business Forum webinar series. Um, now, before we kind of get started, we've just got to go through some couple of house rules, which I think by now everyone is a webinar expert, but still we've got to go through them. Um, so, yeah. Um, so everyone is muted and the video is disabled by default for all participants. Um, but if by um, any coincidence that it is not, um, please ensure that it is, um, all this is enabled. Um, if you do have questions, um, please, note the difference between the Q&A as well as the chat. If you've got questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function to post your questions. Um, this ensures that it will be addressed. For the chat, um, please use that instead if you've got any technical or administrative questions that you would like to channel to Enterprise Singapore directly. Um, and if for any other technical issues, um, you can also kind of email send it to us via email um, or any other things, kind of check out the Zoom website. Um, and for the program that we have today, um, I am going to introduce very shortly uh, Mr. Rahul Ghosh, who is our regional group director, who will kind of give us a couple of minutes of welcome remarks before we launch into the panel. Um, so Rahul, if I could invite you. Uh, to come online to kind of just welcome everyone that we have got assembled today. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and to our friends from Africa, very good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Rahul Ghosh, the Regional Group Director for Africa at Enterprise Singapore, or ESG in short. Uh, welcome to the webinar on transport and logistics technology opportunities in Africa. This is the sixth installment of a series of nine webinars under ESG's Africa Singapore Business Forum. Now, for those who may be unfamiliar, the Africa Singapore Business Forum, or ASBF in short, is one of ESG's flagship events that happens once every two years. The premier platform helps to foster trade and investments between Africa and Asia by bringing together business communities from Africa, Singapore, and Asia. In the past five editions, there have been over 2,000 business leaders and government officials from over 30 African countries that have attended the event physically in Singapore. However, due to the COVID pandemic, we had to postpone ASBF last year. So we are now, this year in August, going to do the ASBF and we'll be sending you the details in, in, in time to come. But please make, it, make, it, make sure that you do attend. The ASBF webinar series has thus far focused on key technology opportunities witnessed in Africa as a result of accelerated digital adoption due to COVID. It is also worth noting that despite the pandemic, 2020 saw Africa as the fastest growing venture capital market with the number of tech-focused equity deals growing by 44% year on year. The logistics and mobility sector particularly saw a total of 157 million US dollars in funding last year alone. To date in this webinar series, we have covered four technology verticals, ed tech, health tech, ag tech, consumer and retail tech. Apart from technology, this webinar series will also be showcasing general market opportunities we have just concluded the Southern Africa Showcase last month, and we'll explore developments in the East, in the North and Western parts of Africa in the coming months leading up to ASBF 2021. Riding on the wave of increasing internet and smartphone penetration in the continent, the transport and logistics sector has seen broad-based technology usage. This includes the use of Internet of Things or IoT for real-time tracking of cargo and vehicles, blockchain for document integrity and data exchange, and drones for last mile delivery of critical supplies are just some examples. Companies in Africa have gradually embraced digitalization to reduce inefficiencies in the logistics chain 
and some have turned these inefficiencies into market opportunities. With the Africa continental free trade area coming live as of January this year, the transport and logistics sector will play an important role in facilitating regional integration and intra-Africa trade. Today's panel will provide an overview on the fast evolving landscape in Africa. You will hear about in-market opportunities, the challenges, and many business innovations that are suitable for the market. On this note, I wish everyone an enjoyable and beneficial session today. And I'd like to hand back to my colleague, Bridget. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rahul, for those welcome remarks. Um, now, it really gives me great pleasure to welcome on board um, the panelists, our really esteemed panelists, each of them experts in their own right, um, having you know, amassed tons of experience operating within the continent for a number of years. Um, and before I kind of hand it over to Chiku, um, just a quick note, um, even though everybody is muted by default, doesn't mean that you remain kind of silent. We encourage you to participate actively throughout this webinar by posting your questions on the Q&A function. Um, now I'd like to kind of hand it over to Chiku, who is the Associate Investment Officer from the IOC, our very capable moderator for this session to introduce our panelists. Over to you, Chiku. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget, and thank you so much, Raul, for the welcome remarks. Um, I'll start by introducing myself and giving a bit of a background on the IFC and the work that we have been doing investing in the region over the last couple of years. And then I'd actually like to ask the panelists to introduce themselves thereafter before we get into the discussion. Um, so uh, my name is Shiko Mugambi. I'm an Associate Investment Officer with the Disruptive Technologies and Funds team at the IFC. Um, here at the IFC, we've been, we've been investing in Africa for over 60 years, and most of our investments have mainly been concentrated in the traditional sectors that we all know of, so infrastructure, financial institutions, manufacturing, agri and services. But in the recent past, uh, roughly about 10 years ago, there was a shift in focus towards early stage investments in the tech space. Early on, our strategy was mainly to focus on uh, clean tech investments and investments in telco infrastructure, such as uh, towers and data centers and the likes. Um, but since then, we've had a lot of experience deploying capital in various other verticals um, in, in markets like China, India, Latin America. And um, more recently, about four, four or five years ago, we decided to also have a very specific focus in deploying um, venture capital in Africa specifically. Um, here in Africa, we consider ourselves to be sector agnostic. So we, we're not necessarily focused on specific verticals, but many of our investments have been in the e-logistics, ed tech um, and enterprise technology space but we do look at investments across various verticals opportunistically. We consider ourselves to be series B or series C investors. So we're not too early stage, but at the same time, we're not on the growth stage uh, phase as well. Uh, we write checks ranging between five and $25 million into companies as well as venture capital funds. And actually Caesar who's here is representing one of the venture capital funds that we have invested in. So that's just a brief background on myself and IFC, and I'm excited to be here as part of this uh, panel today. So I'd like to invite um, the rest of the panelists just quickly introduce themselves, and then we can get into the discussion. So I'll go in the order that I see in front of me. So Caesar, do you mind going first? No problem. So my name is Caesar Nyaga. I'm based in Nairobi. I am an investment officer with Patek. Um, Patek is a global venture capital investment platform. Um, that means we we manage um, several funds that have a focus on um, multiple geographies. Uh, we've got funds that invest in Europe and the US and we've got funds that uh, one fund that invests in Africa. But we also invest across um, the spectrum of uh, the, the tech maturity um, from seed uh, to venture, which, which is primarily series A and B to growth. Um, for the Africa Fund, it's a $150 million fund, um, primarily focused on Series A and B opportunities on the continent. Uh, we've got our headquarters, global headquarters in Paris, but we also have a global, um, Africa headquarters in Dakar, Senegal. And we've got an office in Nairobi as well, where I sit. And um, I'm happy to be here to share um, insights from what we've been able to see on the continent as far as transport and logistics is concerned. Thanks. Thank you, Caesar. 
Um, Trish, do you want to go next? Good morning, everyone. I'm Trish Van Yellen from CarTrack. I'm the general manager of the African continent. We are a global service provider in the telematics industry. We have over 1.2 million subscribers globally. We have 50 plus billion data points throughout the world. And we're in 23 countries over three continents. We focus primarily in Africa from my perspective in growing business, partnering with African businesses and driving growth throughout the continent. Thank you, Trish. Akagura. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kagura Wamunyo. I am the Global Head of Operations for COBO 360. Uh, COBO 360 is, is an e-logistics platform that actually connects uh, transporters uh, who are looking for cargo and, and, and cargo owners who are looking for transporters. Uh, people like to think of it as quite similar to uh, Uber, Uber, but in this case for trucks. However, we are B2B focused where we work with transporters and, and transporter companies. And then we work with companies such as manufacturers, um, agribusinesses, et cetera. Uh, we've been in operation for the past three years, um, started out in Nigeria before expanding out of uh, Nigeria into East Africa. So we have office locations in Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, Ghana, and Togo. What we essentially do, and we have, so we have investors from you know different areas, including IFC, so Shiko, um, and other companies. And what we do is that we understand uh, logistics and we understand how things operate on the ground, and therefore we build technology that creates efficiencies based on how things look like. So in our case, we focus on reliability, we focus on creating efficiencies, and we focus on supporting the ecosystem by providing you know, uh, value added services such as fuel payments, etc., to transporters. Uh, so in a nutshell, we are excited about the opportunity that we see um, in the continent, uh, tapping into the continental free trade agreement, etc. And so in my role, I ensure that we run our operations to ensure growth um, in terms of our uh, number of customers we serve and the number of trips that we do. Thank you. Kagura, last but not least, Rafael. Hi, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Rafael Dana. I'm uh, the co-founder and co-CEO of Gozem. Uh, we are a super app. Uh, I think everybody knows about Grab and Gojek currently. Uh, there's a lot of noise about those two companies. Uh, I'm currently sitting in Singapore. This is where we've started this project. And uh, we are a fully inspired company by Southeast Asia, because I, I lived here um, in Singapore for the last 10 years. And the last three years, we decided to, to start commuting, and now we're almost based in Africa. So our company uh, is a super app, but driven first by transportation. We started with motor taxi and then regular taxi. We started that in Togo, in, uh, in West Africa, in Francophone Africa. This is where we have our, our, our focus right now uh, as a company. And we've quickly expanded to Benin. And during the pandemic, we added uh, delivery services. And now we do vehicle financing. And we also have a wallet. So we have almost deployed most of the key verticals we have in our super app in Togo and Benin. Uh, next week, we're opening Gabon. And I'll just make a small remark. Thanks to the Africa Singapore Business Forum, where we met the Gabonese government that invited us to, to deploy faster in the country. So that happened here in Singapore. Uh, so in a nutshell, this is where we are today. And we'll deploy additional countries, including Cameroon, DRC, and others. And we have a strong focus on francophone. You might have noticed my, my French accent is terrible, uh, but that's about us. Thank you, Raphael. And glad to hear that there were benefits that you got from previous uh, similar forums. Um, so I'd actually like to first start the discussion with the operators in the room. So that's you, Kagura, Trish, and Raphael. Um, starting off by setting the scene on the markets in which you operate in. And what are some of the nuances of that market and how your solution is actually addressing some of the unique challenges that we find in this space that you don't necessarily find in other more developed markets. So for you, Kagure, um, Kobe is one of the uh, largest e-logistics plays that we see in this continent. I think last I checked, you were in about eight countries. 
in both East Africa, West Africa, and even now Francophone Africa. So what has been your approach as you have expanded into each of these markets? And did you have to tailor that uh, to just cater to what you're finding in these, in these markets? Um, so thank you, Shiko. Um, in terms of the different, what we see on the ground that makes the markets unique, you're right to point out that there is a bit of nuances, but the fundamentals remain the same. The things we've identified as a huge challenge, one is visibility. Cargo, when it leaves the, the, if it's a manufacturer, so take an example, somebody like Lafarge. Traditionally, as soon as a transporter picks cargo from Lafarge, it's a Hail Mary that it will get delivered. There's literally no way of knowing where the truck is, knowing what happens. You're not really sure whether the driver is who you see they are, et cetera. Because again, of the, an issue in terms of data storage and finding out who is that driver? Are they really registered? Do they have the right documents? So in terms of the things we've had to be able to do is develop technology that ensures that you can track cargo. So that's the first thing. And this had to be done in very interesting ways. Um, so in other markets, you may immediately think of, okay, let's just put trackers on the, tra on, on the asset. Here you find that the asset has a banker's tracker. It has an insurance company tracker. It has so many people tracking it that we've got to find ways to have mobile, um, mobile tracking or um, portable trackers in the tracks which then adds an added layer of tracking. So we added visibility. The second thing is that we actually do the KYC, that verification that indeed this driver has the required documents to load, that the insurance is indeed there for the cargo to be loaded from point A to B. So you would find that there were many transporters loading without the goods in transit, et cetera. So this was also a product. So we have a Cobo safe product, which is our insurance arm of the product. The third thing is that as we added technology, it became very clear that cash flow is a challenge in the ecosystem. Um, in the continent, payments are done by customers 30 days after. The transporters are considered the SME business. And so banks tend to shy away from providing them working capital to be able to run their assets. So we had to figure out how do you support the ecosystem? How do you ensure that when a truck gets an order from you, they actually have the fuel to get from point A to B. And so we have a system where by providing 50% down payment of the trip cost, we are able to actually add value in terms of they're able to fuel and load the trucks. What this does is that it increases reliability. And uh, now, so you tackle visibility, you tackle reliability. And then the third thing is a lot of movement is cross-border. The opportunities are great with the Continental Free Trade Agreement, but we've always had opportunities with East Africa community, whether it's ECOWAS, et cetera. However, just knowing when cargo is going to come out on the other side, so you're in Kampala and you loaded, you loaded something to the port of Mombasa, you have no idea what is really happening in Mombasa. So having a company that's really looking at things end to end provides that. So those are the three or four areas which we've had to work with. Oh, great. And um, you've mentioned some of the challenges that were particular to some of the markets that um, you're operating in. Uh, what would you say, how has the adoption of Kobo been? Um, because this is a relatively new model. Um, it's a digital platform, which obviously has its challenges when you think about adoption in this part of the world. But how has the platform been received by both the enterprise clients and the tracking partners that you're working with? As there's a lot of enthusiasm, especially from the customer or the cargo owner. They definitely are like, we finally can find a way to have visibility. From the transposters, it's also the same. They, they feel that they, I can actually now be able to tap and load in, um, cargo that they would otherwise not have access to. Because what happens is that as Kobo, I will go in um, and negotiate that, you know, company X, I would like to load for you. I then aggregate transporters who otherwise may not have been able to have, whether it's the cash flow or the insurance, et cetera, to be able to do this and which we provide on our platform for them to be able to do this. So there is that definitely the enthusiasm. What we've now had to build onto this is actually, how do you do this tracking in a continent where there are areas where there's no mobile connectivity? This is some of the things we constantly ask ourselves. And that's why we constantly have to think outside the box. In Kenya, we've had um, tracking through radio signal because radio penetration, radio penetration is very high in Africa. 
And so how do we use this, you know, radio signal that's everywhere to actually send us GPS location? So these are the things that we constantly have to think about because the reality is the are there still remains as much as this great opportunity there's also areas we've got to think outside the box thank you kagore um so you know from long haul to telematics uh, trish i'd like to uh, hear your perspectives on um you know the trends that you have seen in the telematics space over the last couple of years um and what has been the main driver of those trends and uh, you're on mute trish Number one would be fuel being a costly commodity in Africa and with the terrain of the roads that transporters in particular and logistics travel. It's become a necessity for businesses to mitigate those cost losses. So through our efficient management of fuel monitoring coupled with driver behavior for fleet and vehicles, we are able to maintain a well-working fleet as well as the well-being of their drivers and monitor fuel and in particular deep drops in fuel theft. We may not have so many concerns of fuel theft in Africa if we go more north, but we do have a concern from our clients in terms of fuel theft. So through our platform, we've developed and put a lot of time and effort into it being accessible and reliable data on time and real time and accessible anywhere throughout the continent. Great. Um, and then, so, you know, car track, most of car track's operations are in South Africa right now. And South Africa is a lot more developed compared to other African countries. So we find in South Africa, for example, you have bigger fleet managers compared to the rest of Africa where you have much smaller fleet manage, uh, managers, it's a highly fragmented market. So how do you think about your approach as you move outside of South Africa? And then also, you know, where do you think the growth will come from in the future? Will it be mainly from um, B2B models or B2C models? Because I, I'm aware that you cater to both uh, enterprise clients as well as individuals. With regards to approaching the African market, we are very hands-on. We apply our concept, which we do throughout the globe in employing local talent, local culture, people that understand the market that is relatable. We have hands-on approach from our customer service department. We offer hands-on training, whether it is in person. Now with the COVID restrictions, we do it virtually. We have 24 seven control room that is accessible should there be any difficulties. With being said, South Africa is developed much more with the fleet managers, but I don't think the African countries are too far behind there either with the growth in transportation and logistics. So I wouldn't want to sell them too far short in saying they're behind South Africa, but I think it is um, neck and neck and on par with what is happening throughout the continent. Okay, that's, and that's when we want to address, yeah. <laughs> When we're going to address B2B and B2C, I think there are different requirements from both sectors and there is growth we are seeing in both of those channels with clients. The needs are therefore different. With B2C, the need for accessible, reliable and on-time data that is accurate, that has driven the growth in the commercial sector, in particular with companies that are not just based in one country where they want to monitor the transportation of whether it's good services or people, and with the B2C community, you, they're looking more for a safety and security measure, as well as value added services in terms of accident detection or reconstruction. So those alerts and panic buttons should they be caught in a sticky situation. We've also gone so far as to introducing a short term insurance model into our platform, as well as a buying and selling of cars as well, which is open to our consumer base. So we're constantly evolving with the markets, requirements and demands throughout the continent and globally. Great. Um, and this is a follow up question on that. Um, in terms of uh, unit economics and operational complexity, what would you say uh, would be low hanging fruit for an investor who wants to put money in either a B2B versus a B2C model? 
uh, where would be the first sort of you know, model that they would put money into as we wait for the other model to slowly catch on. I think the demands in Africa are becoming more commercially based as we're seeing a lot of foreign companies investing in our continent. As we know, it is a growth continent. We have a young population. The inter-Africa trade is opening opportunities for everyone throughout the continent, as well as for foreign investment. So definitely, if I was going to have to choose one of them, I would say it would be B2C. OK, that's interesting. Thanks for those insights. Um, and I'd like to loop in uh, Raphael into this conversation. Uh, so we've touched on long haul delivery, we've touched on telematics. Um, I'd like to hear a bit more from the mobility space now. And in particular, you mentioned that Togo was one of the first countries that you established your the company in. Um, that's quite an interesting choice of a country. So could you please talk about why and what informed that decision to start off in Togo? And um, you know, your focus is on Francophone Africa in particular. Um, could you talk also about you know, the dynamics of operating a mobility company in Francophone, especially because we know that the, you know, companies like Uber and Bolt have struggled to gain foothold in those markets. So what, what would you say is unique about this market compared to the rest of Africa? Sure. Um, so first, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll start with, so on why to go. And obviously, it's a, it's a question that's well known because I think it's the first question all our all all, all investors are asking us like why are you starting with Togo? And actually, there's a really concrete reason. First is because when we 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 really look at the African opportunity when we started to travel to Africa and, and see like what we potentially wanted to replicate, uh, as many people we started with the usual suspect. We, we went to Nigeria, went to Ghana, went to Kenya, and we said okay, it's busy. There's a lot of people, and and then. We went to Francophone uh, as we're also French and say, okay, there's nobody here. Okay, that's really interesting. The market is massive. Uh, and we say, okay, that's interesting because if you crack Francophone, it seems everybody's a bit scared of this market or they don't come in for some reason, uh, we're going to have a competitive advantage. So it gave us, you no, know, it's a bit, it looks a bit more difficult, but if we get it, then we have something in hand that the other one don't have. So that was our, our first motivation. Then the second part was thinking, okay, Francophone is like 15, 16 countries were, were uh, interesting, but we said, if we go in Ivory Coast or Senegal, we might ex get excited, some big competitions, and oh look, Gozem is there. And we said, let's go in a, in a country that's much smaller, okay? Uh, and then where we can build our, our super app ecosystem. We're gonna be under the radar. Nobody's gonna come and bother us with Togo. So people say, you sure it's the right choice? Yeah, nobody's gonna come and that's the truth. Nobody came for the last two and a half years since we started in Togo and, and then expanded to Benin. And we've been able to, to put the mobility to boot delivery, now we do uh, lend, uh, vehicle financing, and we're, we have much more coming. And since then, nobody's competing with us. Then the first thing is was also really from a, a cash point of view, is that you arrive in Africa, you're building a mobility company super app, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. I've built startups all my life, you make mistakes. That's just a reality uh, we all know as an entrepreneur. So the big thing was like, we're thinking, and I always make this joke, saying we prefer making $1 mistakes in Togo than $100 mistakes in Nigeria. Because when you arrive in a really big market, you have a lot of competition, you have a lot of pressure. And when you make it wrong, it costs you a fortune. Then you need to, you need to go and see your investor and explain why you burn so much cash in some mistakes. It was not good. So that was like uh, the third part. And uh, the last one was also the francophone is we consider the francophone uh, as a one big market because it's one language, it's one currency except DRC, uh, it's one legal system, okay, and it's mostly the same partners. We work with Total, we work with MTN, I and mean, it's uh, mostly all around. So we always make this comparison: it's like opening a new country in francophone CFA. It's like opening a new state in the U.S. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. it's not exactly the same, but it's not dramatically different. You know, so what we've built there, uh, we can replicate. So we did Togo. Uh, we did Benin, who was nearby. So we've been able to really build a second operation and scale. And now we're uh, opening Gabon next week. Uh, so we already have the team on the ground and it's going to be a, a taxi market. And as we speak, we are incorporating Cameroon and DRC. So yeah, we focus completely on the francophone. Um, and when and, and, and to your second question, is like, what is really uh, uh, specific about the francophone? I think first, I think it's it's a really big informal market, okay? Uh, so you really need to understand how you're really moving from the informal to formalizing this, okay? And it's true that 
technology is instrumental because everybody that tried to do non-technology solution, it's, it's impossible. You need data, you know, and that's what we're doing every day. We're building data, and even during COVID, some government reached out to us asking data on transportation and drivers we didn't have. So we're accumulating a, a ton of data uh, for the good uh, of, of our business. So that's the, uh, the 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 first thing really specific on the on the francophone side. And I would say like the uh, the, the second one is that uh, you're alone. So uh, that's also a, a really good point, but you have a bigger responsibility because you have to educate the market, okay? And it costs you a, a bit more as well. And at the same time, you don't have any benchmark. Uh, so it's, it's true even when we speak to investors, always the big question is like, oh, why you're alone in Francophone? It shouldn't be an interesting market. Uh, why you're there? And so far, it's just an amazing market. So we're just happy that nobody wants to come and we hope it's gonna keep like this for a while. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so this is a, the, the really interesting thing about uh, uh, the Francophone market. Okay, that's, that's great uh, that you have no competition and knock on wood, it stays like that, or at least you're the dominant player for a while. Uh, but in terms of the future outlook, do you think that um, there is a plan for you to branch out of Francophone? Um, and, and what would be the sort of expected timelines for that? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, it's part of our plan. Huh? I mean, for, for the people that might have seen our deck, uh, including Partech or other VC, uh, uh, that, that knows our plan, but we have a really clear plan. Our plan is first, we want to own Francophone. So we don't want to do anything else before we have a really strong foothold and ownership and really master uh, the full CFA uh, countries plus DRC, who's like 230 million. And that's why we say, we say the average G GDP per capita maybe not as good as Nigeria, you know, when you look at it, but overall it's still 230 million population you're serving where you're alone and where we will completely deploy a full super app that includes transportation from motor taxi, taxi, tricycle, pickup to delivery where we deliver full solution for the African market. We deliver big bag of rice for family or big bottle of, of oil, the gas bottle. Uh, we, uh, we have a custom solution. Uh, so some people always tell us, oh, I've seen, you know, whatever, like Glovo is in Abidjan. So yeah, but Glovo, they deliver sushi to expat in Abidjan. That's not my market. You know, it's, it's a tiny part. You know, the question is that are they going to build all those companies, including Uber? Uh, because when you do the motor taxi, you have to finance the bike, you have to train. It's an African solution as well. So yeah, Uber, they do uh, ride dealing, you know, in Lagos, they do private car, with credit cards, so all of this. And sometimes they do some small adjustment, but it's not mm -hmm. a full African solution. So this is where... Uh, we, uh, we really make the difference. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I'd like to loop in my fellow investor in the room, Caesar. Um, Partech is well known for doing this very fantastic annual VC report, um, showcasing the trends in you know, how much capital has been deployed in the region, where is it going, and you know, which stage of investment is most attractive. And so um, you know, we saw that in the last report, the 2020 report, only about 6% of the capital that was deployed in, in Sub-Saharan Africa in VC went into e-logistics. Um, could you just give us a bit more context about why you think that is and how you think that's going to shape out in the near future as well? Uh, especially when you think about you know, how fundamental logistics is as the backbone of you know, many other economies. Um, and so it's surprising that it's only attracting quite a small proportion of the capital. Yeah, sure. I think um, if you look at the report, every, everything is attracting a small, every sector is attracting a small amount compared to fintech. I think when, te when technology came, um, and of course fintech attracts about a quarter of all the funding that goes into African tech startups. And primarily that's probably most because it's, there wasn't a solution that existed for people who could not access um, financing and technology provided that. While on the logistics end, there's already a traditional ecosystem that exists and tech only comes to enable it to make it more efficient. So I think that's one of the reason, and I think you've mentioned it, that fundamentally um, logistics is a backbone uh, sector. It's the sector that allows the movement of goods and the movement of people. So it, it eventually I think will catch up. Um, it's just that uh, it's um, what you're doing is enabling an already existing ecosystem to use technology that has other dependencies. For example, it will depend on uh, 
the amount of smartphone penetration. Its growth depends on that. If you're building an app, for example, and in some of these economies that uh, we see around Africa, you know, people are still using features phones. And to use smartphones, of course, you need the internet to, to work or to be available, the infrastructure, and to be affordable. So it does rely on some other pieces. Um, that, that would probably be my second point. And, and then the third one is, um, Yes, logistics may be looking to attracting 6%, but there are other sectors that um, are heavy logistics users, but they're not um, categorized as logistics fundamentally. For example, if, if you look at agri-tech, if you're automating the, the supply chain for inputs and maybe um, on, the outer, on the other side, you're helping farmers market produce, that requires a certain level of logistics, right? But the funding that goes to that company will be categorized as agri-tech, not necessarily mm -hmm. logistics, right? So there mm -hmm. is that other reason that um, there's a lot being invested in logistics. It just may be hidden within other sectors. Healthcare is another one, right? If you're doing an Uber for, uh, for ambulances, for example, um, if that company attracts uh, investment, it may be categorized as healthcare, not necessarily as logistics. Uh, another mm -hmm. one, maybe a uh, famous one, is um, using drones for healthcare delivery, right? That may also be categorized as a healthcare um, deal, not necessarily as a logistics uh, deal. But because logistics is so fundamental to most of these sectors, um, it, it sort of takes um, a hidden um, role or a, a backbench to, to the primary sector, but still, they still quite a bit of investment going actually into the actual logistics of it. Okay, fantastic. And you've actually touched on a question I was going to ask in terms of the specific verticals that you have seen to be interesting within this logistics space. So thank you for that. Um, my other question regarding that report is um, in terms of country allocations. It was interesting to note that Kenya actually attracted a much higher share of the logistics investments compared to a country like, say, Nigeria. And when you put it into context in terms of, you know, Nigeria being five times, Nigeria's economy being about five times the size of Kenya's economy, um, the market potential in terms of the logistics space in Nigeria being significantly higher than Kenya. Um, so could you maybe explain a bit more about why you think Kenya was still on the forefront compared to Nigeria? Yeah, at least for, for last year, Kenya was on the forefront compared to Nigeria. Uh, that position could change this year because uh, given how fundraising goes, you know, you, you don't raise every year. So that could flip. But um, I think Kenya tends to be a really good testing ground for some of these solutions, just given the, the, the development of especially of, mo um, of uh, mobile money. And I think if you recall when some of these um, ride hailing companies came in when they were only taking cards, um, I don't think the growth was as good as it was once they introduced the ability to pay via mobile money. Just given the, res the reason that everybody has, you know, M-Pesa on their phones and can pay via M-Pesa or other mobile money um, um, solutions. So I think Kenya tends to be a really good testing ground, especially for uh, very attractive for foreign investors uh, or foreign entrepreneurs who want to start something. Um, but again, I think that again is probably likely to change this year. Of course, we, we, we have the we have some insight into what is going on in the sector given that we're on the investor mm -hmm. side um, but but i think nigeria is definitely um a large market for sure you know 200 million people who must eat who must move from one point a to point b um it, it, and again it was a covid year so so some of the large ticket deals did go away uh last mm -hmm. year we, we are seeing some of them coming back so last year's number may not be necessarily a reliable number but again kenya is um is a good ecosystem for testing. Nigeria is the largest market on the continent, so one of the most attractive markets. And if you look mm -hmm. at the way um, the distribution of the funding is, goes, it primarily goes into those two ecosystems, the Kenya and the Nigeria one, and maybe the South Africa and the Egypt one. Those attract about 75 to 80% of the funding. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd just like to remind the participants that you know, if you have any questions or feedback or comments for any of the panelists, please feel free to use the Q&A functionality. Um, so I'd like to shift focus now to specific products. Um, and I'd like, you know, some of you have touched on this already. So uh, Kagura, you mentioned Kobo Safe. You've also mentioned Copay. Um, I'd be curious to know how core these additional value added products have been to your core competency of logistics 
and what you think the trends will be in the future? Do you think that it will actually shift from being a more logistics focused business to now being fundamentally a value added services business? Um, I, th I think that um, it's going to be a more value added um, kind of system. Um, the, the reason is that, um, as you know, as a company that has been pioneering technology and logistics here, in terms of in the, in the modern way of thinking about it, like a platform, we've identified the key problems. And the key problems really have to do with, you know, our, the copy. So this is the funding to be able to just operate the trucks. Um, it, has to do with the insurance, it has to do with the whole tracking element in terms of just knowing where you're tracking at in one time when it's carrying cargo. And so when we think about areas of opportunity for growth for us, that we have what we call, you know, it's being able to support the ecosystem that it can sustain itself through our copay product. We think this is how the future is going to look like. And our copay product is a product that looks I am a customer, I have 50 transporters, I have one big aggregator and then have many smaller transporters that I also work with. I still struggle to work with them because when I give them orders, I'm not really sure whether or not they fuel, I'm not really sure whether or not they can maintain their tracks and so they are less reliable. And so Kobo will remain the aggregator that it is, but it's also going to come in through their copy product and support the ecosystem, including these other uh, transporters through providing them this value added services. So not only just play the traditional role of aggregator, but also this. Um, and this is in part to do with the challenges, as you said, uh, you know, the challenges are not just really the streamline, you know, interest tech, but the ecosystem also lurks that element um, product. Okay, cool. And and Raphael, you also mentioned the super app that Gozem is building. Um, I'd be curious to know about the adoption of these additional um, so the digital wallet, the e-commerce delivery. Um, how has the adoption of those additional services been? Um, in addition to obviously the transportation piece, which I assume you know that's running fairly smoothly. And then um, you know you mentioned Grab and Gojek as well. So what lessons have you borrowed from these platforms that you are adopting in in uh, Benin and in Togo where you're operating right now? Sure. Um, so I'll, um, as I said before, uh, we have no competition. So uh, uh, so it's, it's a bit difficult for us into the adoption to to really be a hundred percent objective. Uh, because every time we provide a service, uh, people are, are, are quite the, the first one to, to try. Uh, it's true that at the same time, we try to, to provide a service that um, um, answer their local needs. Uh, we don't want to provide something that's completely out, out of the blue. So that's why, for example, in the delivery, the gas bottle, what you're going to find in any household, uh, in any family, because they need to cook. It's a complicated thing. It's heavy. This is, nobody's happy to move the gas bottle. Uh, so that's one key service we include in the super app, uh, as well as the food. But so far, every time we add services, uh, we see a, 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 an amazing adoption and, and it even go further. We have people from any type of businesses come into our office all the time and say, oh, we're a super app. We see we have the motorcycle, you have the car. You have, can you add this? Can you add that? Can you build that for us? So we have a massive pressure now for school tra transportation because it's a big problem. So we're building right now uh, a direct solution for this. We're, we're deploying corporate solution for a lot of companies that tell us, you know, we have too many employees, too many fleet, it costs us a fortune, can we just have a direct account for all their employees uh, to go around, uh, and so on. And we, we people asking for ticketing solution. So I would say it's, it's, it's even at the opposite. We have a massive traction because people realize that we have the technology, we have the, the engineers to, to build a solution. We have already a lot of user, and they're coming to us as a, um, uh, a solution provider. So, so far, we have a really big traction, a really big adoption. But as I said, nobody is competing against us. So we have this uh, really big attention in all the countries, which is really good. And that's part of our strategy. Okay. And in terms of the lessons learned from Southeast Asia and what has helped you uh, scaling up these super app in, in Benin and Togo? I think it's really interesting because if I look back a few years ago, you would go to Europe or you would go to US and you would talk about the super app. And most of the VC would tell you, oh, we, 
we don't like this strategy. You know, you have to be really focused. You have to do one thing and do it well. You know, this Asian story, like I do everything, it's wrong. You know, uh, so that's what you would hear like three, four years ago when people were, were thinking about the super app. I think now many people came back to uh, on this theory because you see WeChat and now you see, I mean, Grab is going to be the biggest SPAC ever on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and we see that on informal market, it's really solving um, a lot of problem. But obviously, we are on markets who are emerging or frontier. So the margin of every transaction low. So you, have, you need this volume effect with uh, instrumental in order to make it profitable. But at the same time, many more businesses and you're, so you're you have this uh, amazing ecosystem you are building around. So we've seen that anything was implemented in Southeast Asia can be implemented in Africa. And we've even seen, I think, for example, the gas bottle. Uh, it's really something we, we really uh, trigger from Togo and Benin that we haven't really seen you know, in Indonesia or Vietnam. So we're adding things on top. But whatever we see here in the region uh, makes sense. I, I think something we're less interested, it's about the credit card. I think people don't really care in our market about the credit card. They have no network. Uh, people are really thinking about, uh, I think it's really about a peer-to-peer -peer wallet solution. Our wallet will be uh, under license in partnership with banks in a few months. And that's going to be a game changer because our wallet is already uh, well deployed as a closed wallet, as a store value uh, for rides and other services. But soon we're going to, it's a question of month, we're going to be able to do peer-to-peer -peer remittance. And the nice thing about Africa is that you have a nice fintech ecosystem. You have a lot of beautiful API we can connect to our wallet soon uh, so we're really looking forward and we're we doing vehicle financing as i said the delivery and the transport and that's our our all our key vertical we're pushing and same as grab and gojek we're all discussing actively and we have announcement in a few weeks on integrating third parties that's going to be able to use our infrastructure use our transport our last mile delivery our payment and even potentially our lending doing what they do Okay, fantastic. And um, Trish, I'd like to move over to you right now because you've done the opposite, expanding from Africa to Southeast Asia with uh, your recent expansion into Singapore. Um, could you maybe give us a bit of you know, insights into, into what that experience has been like for you? Uh, you're on mute. The economies are very different, but I think you can draw parallels not only between Africa and Asia, but between many different markets. And I think with our experience in dealing with 23 countries around the world, we take all of the knowledge we've gained since inception with the business and all our know-how and be able to build that and marry everything together and take the nuances between each market and build the best solution for our customers. You know, we learn our lessons as we go along. And as much as the markets are different, there are general trends throughout the globe. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm conscious of the time, but I'd like us to just quickly touch on COVID because that's always the elephant in the room. Um, but I'd also like us to focus on um, the, what the future looks like uh, for logistics in Africa. Um, so, you know, COVID has happened, it's been a very painful experience for the world and it has shaped how we live our lives as well as how we do business. Um, could you just talk, for, uh, especially uh, Kagure for you, Trish and Raphael, could you talk a bit about how you see, you know, what will remain even after the pandemic is hopefully over soon? What do you think is going to remain in the way that you've changed your business model, um, if at all you have, and you know, what's going to remain into the future? Maybe Trish, you can go first. So with Cartrack, we've invested over the years in technology, not, a, not only customer facing, but in the way we operate our business internally, which, is allow, which has allowed us to come out of COVID quicker than our peers. And, um, you know, our ability to work with our own proprietary software to monitor our staff and be able to service our clients as an essential service. We're a 24 hour business, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So, you know, we're taking what we've learned from COVID we're working on what we can do better, we've adapted, and we're gonna to continue to focus on accelerating our growth to deliver the best service to our clients. And we are seeing a return to normality in, both, in most of our industries that we service, but I think it all comes from you know, being adaptable and flexible and having 
control over your development as a team and as a global company. Okay. Um, Kagure, um, are there things that you changed in Kobo because of the pandemic and those things will continue to remain in the future? I think one of the things that we changed that will continue is definitely diversification of sectors or loadings. So as an example, uh, in one of the markets, we're very heavy on port business. And when COVID started, you know, the port dried out because cargo was not leaving China to come into Africa. And so we quickly had to realize in every market, even if you've cracked a sector, you've got to try, go beyond. So whether it's port business, cement business, agriculture, raw material, FMCG, et cetera. And so that will remain critical, such that in every single country that we operate or serve, uh, there'll be that diversification. But one positive for us is that it has pushed a lot of these customers because the customers we deal with, we would consider them more, you know, the old companies that have been in existence for a hundred years, et cetera. Um, selling them a new product, especially technology, there's always a pushback from them. and. This actually showed them the importance of tech, that you did, I didn't have to go sit, deliver invoices and deliver proofs of delivery or way bills, which is what they're used to. It's what they like. We, logistics is, we love paper logistics generally. And so it's shown people that it's not always possible that someone can travel to deliver a piece of paper. So how can, how is it, do you know, online invoicing? How can we do online proofs of delivery? And so, it's accelerated the tech adoption uh, within the market. Okay, um, Rafael. Sure. So I think us it was uh, quite uh, an interesting uh, view in the sense that we're in the B two C market and we're working with the informal market. So the first thing we've learned and we've seen uh, our government that to manage is that you cannot stop informal at scale. You know, people in the street, merchant, uh, drivers. You know who are not really re regulated, you know, they can take their bike and they can potentially go out. Uh, it's true that many people didn't go to work and uh, uh, a lot of economic activity went slow down. So last year, exactly Q2, we've lost 40% of our volume compared to, to Q1. So it has been uh, really difficult for us, but Q3, we're back over Q1. So it has really been a, a really short stop. Uh, so what we've learned is that uh, I think for us is that at least in our region that they've been really resilient and it's true and it's true I explain that to many people sometime outside Africa that the population is really young it's really warm uh, immune system is really strong uh, so we had different parameters that makes that uh, it was less impacted we, we believe so um, and what we've seen as well is that when those kind of event happened you need data and we never had that many requests from, uh, from government. We were the first one to help. They were asking, you know, we want to know what are the drivers, how much they earn, and they want to build a program. And we've been like giving all the data they needed to, to work on this. Uh, and we're really happy to, to see that we, we can help uh, as a technology company and we can make a difference, even uh, helping government in a critical situation like this. But I would say overall, it pushed our, our, our delivery services. We we're not ready at that time. And it's true, but with less volume, we said, okay, Let's work on the product, you know. Uh, let's pull out our delivery. Let's let's work more on our wallet, uh, and also because it was a bit a bit a difficult economic situation, let's help our driver uh, finance their bike, you know. So it pushed uh, during those one two quarter where this big slowdown. It pushed all our vertical uh, immediately. It was good. It was accelerated because we're more focusing on the growth of our, of our mobility uh, before that, and we. We started this year with all our verticals open and then all our volume are back. Uh, and to be honest, compared to many companies as a B2C, uh, we haven't felt that bad the COVID. I mean, now for us, we're almost back to normal. Uh, we know there's a, a, a slight impact, but so far so good. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. Um, and hopefully we'll all get past this soon. Um, so now shifting gears into what the future looks like uh, for logistics in Africa. And there are a couple of things that excite me in particular, uh, starting with AFTA, which uh, Rahul, you mentioned at the beginning of this uh, discussion. So, um, you know, the implementation of the agreement you know, started off in 2021, and it's exciting to imagine what a consolidated African bloc would look like from a trading and economic perspective. 
um, you know, Kagure and, and also for you, Trish, have you started to see the implementation of some of the specific clauses of this agreement affecting your enterprise clients? And is it making it easier, is it making it easier for you to do business, um, especially because you're in multiple countries and multiple regions? We definitely are seeing it being easier to deal with African companies. And I think that, you know, relating back to COVID, I think we're at a point now where we want to see each other go. So you're seeing Africa investing in Africa. And I think that's, that's a general message throughout the continent. They're giving more opportunity to locally based companies. And I think there's also been a lot of legislation within government that is driving African businesses to deal with African businesses to grow that growth. So definitely we are seeing a change in dealing with local business, as well as you can see infrastructure being put in place for transportation. You can see that being built up already throughout the continent when you're traveling. And um, I think that leads to, to the confidence that we have, that we are in the right space and we are going to grow with the, with the demand and that we can see that there will be an increase. Okay, fantastic. Kagure? Yeah, so I, I would say it's quite similar to what Trish is saying. So right now we are at that stage where the businesses are trying to now um, position themselves to utilize the agreement. So what we're seeing is companies that had not thought of certain ter territories reaching out to us and saying, hey, we're thinking of, you know, going into DRC or, Cong uh, or Congo Republic, etc. Um, so can you support us in this ecosystem? Do you know of any banks already working there? So what are we seeing is that that um, the businesses waited until the agreement came to pass. And now is when they're looking at their expansion strategy and the, whether it's the trade. Um, and so we, we will see almost for the next few months that happening before we can actually see a huge boom in terms of the actual you know, movement of cargo across the borders. But what I would say is that if it's anything like the localized agreements we've been seeing, whether it's the East Africa community or ECOWAS, it really is going to ease movement significantly because already in this community, because of these agreements that the countries have, it's so much easier to move as compared, you know, whether it's the SADAC, the South African development, you know, community, just movement within is so much easier than movement from one community to the other community. So mm -hmm. quite excited about the endless opportunities. And I always say it would be great to see cargo moving from Kenya all the way to Dakar, you know, that's what we're envisioning. Okay, fantastic. Um, Raphael, I'm not sure if this really uh, would affect you specifically because I imagine no, mobility yeah, is more I'd be really quick on this. We're, we're B2C uh, serving people yeah. at the national level. So right now, to be yeah. honest, we don't see any impact. It's, uh, okay. Maybe at some point, but for now, and I think in the near future, we don't, we, we're not affected and we don't see any benefit. Okay. Um, and then climate is also another interesting angle um, and logistics is a key sector in terms of you know, driving greenhouse gas emissions. So the onset of <clears throat> electric vehicles is quite an interesting um, vertical that's emerging. Uh, we're already seeing it gaining a foothold in more developed markets. Um, and a few companies here in Africa, Ampersand, was it last week that announced a fundraise um, so it's, it's, you know, still early days, but, um, you know, Caesar, I'd like to get your perspectives on what you think from an investor's perspective, uh, what your views are on this space, um, and how quickly a VC fund like Partech can see itself deploying capital in this space. Um, I think the development of the electric space, um, electric mobility space is, is a positive, is a positive, uh, is a move in the right direction as far as um, providing an alternative, but more so also being in environmentally friendly. One of our portfolio companies that is in the uh, business of financing motorcycle motorcycle taxis is actually running a pilot with electric bikes. Right now, the the challenge will the primary challenge probably will be the infrastructure for for charging. 
but I think there's some governments um, that are starting to invest in that infrastructure. And I think as more and more of that infrastructure is is um, brought online, um, then the, the consumer taste and the buyer's taste will change towards it as an alternative. Um, so I think it's um, it's developing gradually. Um, I think in the next, I don't know, maybe five or so years, we will have the, the charging ports uh, across the continent widely available, or at least in some ecosystem, because I think that's a limiting factor. Um, and um, it, it then becomes an interesting space for uh, consideration. As I mentioned, we, we're already running a pilot in, with one of our portfolio companies in that particular space, just to see the level mm -hmm. of uptake that electric bikes may have. Okay. Um, and, and for you, Kagure and Raphael, are any of the vehicles you have on your platform right now um, electric? And is there an intention for either Kobo or Gozem to go into the electric vehicle space in the near future? Okay, where are you want to go first? Okay, sure. Um, so currently we do not have electric trucks. I think uh, just thinking about the distances and the you know the electricity structure we're talking about to deal with uh, long haul trucks. However, what we have is uh, energy efficient uh, in terms of fuel efficient trucks. And that's really focused on and really trying to move because we still have in some of our markets like Nigeria, really old trucks that are very fuel inefficient. So from our focus on greenhouse emission and being um, our focus on clean energy, we're now moving and pushing the market uh, to be able to acquire trucks efficient. So that's the stage the logistics sector is really at at the moment um, but we're very excited about the opportunity of infrastructure could be built where we could um, charge the trucks and just have electric trucks uh, this would make sense um, and something that we're always ready to take up mm -hmm. right so i think uh, on our side it's uh it's really interesting because uh ev motorcycle is booming you have a, a lot of, of, of motorcycle coming all around the world because people are coming to us and I think the biggest concern we have is that our drivers are really uh, in, in the low income range. They're quite poor people. And what we explain to the people that come, and because we, we, we speak to a lot of impact investors and ESG, and we say, you know, I think even our, our ESG part is our, our first KPI is to make the life of our driver better. Okay. So mm -hmm. before we're going to save the planet, those people need to make more money. They need to have insurance. They need to have uh, education for their kids, you know. So, and, and, and it's true that in the order of priority, this is where we go. And as second, it's true that we have two pilots who are going to start next month on EV. And the pilot is sure, there's the technical part, the charging, but this is not what we really care about. The, the first mm -hmm. thing we're going to look at is the economic viability that can we provide a cheaper bike that the cost per uh, operating kilometer should be cheaper than petrol. Because if it's not, I say, you know, you cannot blame those poor people riding those bikes every day transporting people that they don't want to save the planet and pay more money for this, no? Even in our, in our developed countries, people still buy, you know, uh, petrol, BMW, and they pollute, and they don't really care. So I don't think nobody can blame those drivers. But it's true that we want to crack the solution that if we get it cheaper, then it's fantastic. Because then we're really, we're really crossing two lines, the line of the fact that they're going to have a better bike with less vibration, not making noise, uh, who's cheaper every day, okay? And at the same time, it's gonna be really sustainable. Uh, and this is what we want to, to understand, but we need a bit more time. I said two, two pilots, but we, have, we might have two more coming. We need to test a lot of bike, a lot of charging station, look at the model, and we need to see that in condition with the, with the, with the heat, with the humidity, with the dust, you know? Because mm -hmm. what works in, in Berlin, uh, we need to see how it works in Lomero and Cotonou. So it, it's a different configuration uh, from a geographic perspective. But we're really excited about it, obviously. Yeah, well, you've hit the nail on the head by you know, talking about the need to balance the, obviously climate change and climate is a very important conversation, but we also need to balance it out with the economic realities of the drivers uh, here in Africa and the operating environment in drive of, of Africa as a region, especially when you think about how underdeveloped our power sector is. And I think that's actually a good segue into the next topic that I wanted us to touch on briefly, which is on financing, whether it's uh, working capital financing and Kagura, you touched on this briefly with Kope, or vehicle financing, which you touched on, Raphael. 
um, especially because this is something that not only makes commercial sense, uh, but also has a significant development impact when you think of empowering drivers to increase the income that they generate. And at the same time, obviously increasing the number of vehicles on platforms like Kobo and, and Gozan. So um, how is that developing for, the, for, for you, uh, Raphael, especially when you, on the vehicle financing piece? Um, you know, how are you sourcing capital for this particular initiative? Are you getting it from local commercial banks and are they receptive to working with new you know, startups like Gozam? And then on the adoption side with the drivers, are they keen to tap into this as a, as a financing source for their vehicles? Sure, thank you for this question. It's a, it's, it's a really hot topic right now inside our company and we're really excited about, about this opportunity. But it, it took us some time uh, to build a framework to be able to do a, a proper uh, vehicle financing solution for our drivers. And I'm just going to tell you quickly five, six steps we have to develop. It's first, we have, we have to identify some of the drivers. We need to KYC them. So I, see, I can see with Kobo, we have some of the same process. KYC is really important. You can exactly who's the driver, how we can identify him and get back to him if needed. And then, then we need to build a credit scoring. You know? So we need to have a driver working on the bike for a number of weeks, and we need to see his capability to pay back on a daily basis because economics of a, of a motor taxi or the driver is on a daily basis. People say, oh, mm. you pay at the end of the month. So no, it cannot save on even on a week. So we need to have uh, the PNL is a daily PNL we're working on. Then we need to uh, track the vehicle. So we have GPS tracking, geofencing, and all the solutions, and we have a team to, uh, to manage this. We need to collect the money every day, okay? And we uh, also need to manage the default. So we've put in place all these solutions to us like more than a year. And we, to answer specifically your questions, we are a multi-channel model, okay? Originally, we built that to work with local banks, which actually we are doing right now. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a few banks that actually use all our servicing to, 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 to create the loan. But this is a bit, uh, uh, culturally, it's a bit difficult because for them, they were like the last people they fought in their life, they would lend money, you know? An informal driver in the street, they don't really know who he is to give him like the equivalent of a thousand dollar and he's gonna pay back in 24 months. Then we have uh, a second model where we work with, we are creating fleet managers, partnering with people that are buying buy, bike at scale and putting driver there. And now recently it was really exciting. We are building our own loan book, okay? And we're gonna lend this money to our drivers. So we're putting some of our own money and we have other investors coming in this loan book and we're gonna be able to, to deploy. Right now we have zero default so far. It's working really well, uh, but also because it's all about, uh, we're tracking with the data, with the GPS, with the, with the tracker on the bike. And we have a really, really strong process from selecting, tracking, coaching, uh, and up to managing the default. But, but just to, to finish, the market is massive. Is, is, is massive. And what is most important in terms of adoption, we are cheap, much cheaper than the informal market, okay? And you know the rules with us, They're, we're a company, you know? So, so the, the rules are set, there's no surprise when you're gonna borrow the money from an individual, you don't know what's gonna happen. So uh, it's, it's, it's clear, so they love it. And as well, we've built an entire ecosystem all around this, we give you a cheaper bike, but you have access to cheaper food on daily payment, you have access to payment for school. So we are adding a lot, 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 much more advantage to our driver and we say you want to be alone in the street and manage with an individual at high rates, or you want to build or be integrated in a full ecosystem with us, where you're gonna have a much more advantage. We even have immediate credits if you have a breakout with your with your bike, and you need to to buy spare parts. If you're a good driver, you can access to direct money. So you have a lot, lot of advantage, and we we'll keep on adding this. And it's called a program called Smiling Champions because our drivers are called Champion. The Smiling Champion programs include all of this. Okay. Um, Kagura, do you want to talk briefly about your asset financing and working capital financing programs? Uh, yes. Um, so I think for us, the, the question was on, you know, the, the capital and financing the ecosystem. Uh, when we started out, I think, using uh, equity we raised, whether it's from our three big investors, IFC, Goldman Sachs, Telcom. Um, and then we quickly realized we were growing much faster than we can go out to raise capital, even from a time perspective. And so our product, we have a product called Copay that uh, finances the ecosystem in terms of being able to provide 
against two transporters of fueling and we went to bank uh, we went to local banks uh, um, in Nigeria, such as UBA Union Bank, in Kenya banks such as Mayfair Bank. So a whole local banks that we worked with and we've been quite successful in terms of being able to raise working capital. The way we operate that is that we are able to um, really provide work to the ecosystem that allows the trips to happen. And in the process, we do a fee um from this and so in addition we're able to create revenue from just this being able to finance and uh, manage the system so i think as of last year we had raised about 20 million dollars from banks to just be able to do this and this year we are expecting to raise over 60 million dollars from local banks um so from an opportunity perspective it is huge uh, opportunity in logistics is is that it's just there if we could even get you know it's our ability to scale in terms of we're really working on because the opportunities are endless and in multiple markets um the banks as soon as they understood our tech system how we mitigate risk how we understand the ecosystem and how we create those we work with then they were willing to work with us and what we've seen is we're really able to increase uh, supply or transporters for manufacturers by as much as 20 percent and this and one of the challenges they face and they say, you know, I'm not able to increase my capacity as a manufacturer because I just, just don't have a logistics partner. So again, the working capital has been good and the banks have been very, very receptive. Okay. Well, that's great to hear. I suppose uh, technology really is a solution to addressing this you know, lack of financing problem, problem because the data that you generate from the platform really is a sweet source of being able to make informed decisions about the credit risk of the people that you're, you're working with. Um, so it's great to hear that both Kobo and Gozem are you know, leading the charge on this particular front. And with that, um, we've come to the end of our interesting panel discussion. At least it was interesting for me. I hope it was interesting for all the listeners and participants as well. Um, so I'd like to open up the session now for questions, and I can see that we already have a few in the chat, so I'll just quickly get into this. Um, and there's one particular one that I'll start from, an anonymous attendee on air cargo transportation, which we haven't actually touched on in this panel. So um, I think this is probably more relevant for you, Kagure. Um, you know, what has been any, have, have there been any innovations that you have seen in the air cargo transportation? And actually not just you, Kagur, and anybody else on the uh, panel who wants to chime in here. As, so as Kobo, we've not ventured into the air cargo space. Um, I think that it does exist within the market. It's mainly handled by more of the larger, um, you know, logistics companies, the DHLs, et cetera. Um, air freight is not as well developed in the continent. So in terms of where do you land, where do you pick a cargo? And the cost um, remains a huge barrier um, in terms of, you know, thinking about it as a market of entry. And so for us, because of the endless opportunity, we're still, when you, when you look at the continent, road is yet to be you know tapped into and real and so because just of the bare nature the nature in terms of the infrastructure needs that are, are there and the costs then we decided to focus on road and rail and i think the opportunity there still remains untapped okay um there's a specific question for you rafan um, you know, we have an attendee who's a recent graduate in Switzerland who's thinking of starting an e-logistics company in Africa. Um, and he, he wants tips from you on how he can go about setting up the business and getting it off the ground. Uh, okay, that's a really large question. <laughs> uh, but obviously you have to go on the ground. That's where you have to start. Uh, you need to build data. Well, that's what we did with Gozem before starting anything. We've built a lot of data. And even we did it like from a really manual perspective. So when people ask me, you know, we were like taking drivers in the street. We hired those driver like for two weeks, 20, 30 of them, they had a piece of paper and they were writing every ride with any pieces of information. We're collecting that every day, verifying it was right. And we've built a massive set of data. And from there, we've been able to analyze the market. So yeah, it's go on the ground, uh, get some data. Uh, and then you need the, the 
you know, really a, a local team, what we did, I mean, 98% of our staff uh, are in Africa. I'm the only one who's commuting quite a lot because I'm the fundraiser. Uh, so I need to be in London and other places uh, to find the money. But yeah, you have to be uh, really underground. And at the same time, you need to build to build a solution that really uh, uh, solve local problem. So this is what we've been, and that's a massive focus in our company. Is just like stop looking at things outside that doesn't make sense. And even up to, when I say local, we think something about francophone or even about Togo. Sometimes people come with idea from Nigeria and we're like, no, it doesn't apply to Togo. Or they come from Kenya and we're like, it doesn't apply neither. As, and, and, and as the opposite, you have to really be underground and really think local, especially in Africa. So that would be my uh, high level quick tips. Okay, uh, thank you for the two minute business school <laughs> lesson. Um, there's actually another question for you here, Raphael, um, about how will Gozem provide their users the ability to access ride hailing in micro mobility on a global super app level? I think my understanding of this is could potentially Gozem work with other global super apps and make it easy for any user from anywhere in the world to access um, these services. So to, to be uh, straightforward and direct is we have no plan on this. We're really focusing on, a, on an, an African solution. Uh, it's a nice to have, uh, we, we could have, but people can still use Uber or Freenow or many other apps around the world. I don't think there's any specific uh, value add uh, for us uh, at that level. Mm, okay. Um, Caesar, there's a question here for you. Um, about whether in your experience you're seeing some of these new tech solutions actually changing the realities on the ground or whether they're just you know, tech products that maybe sometime in the future can have some form of application in the region. Um, do you think that um, they're actually making a difference in the way that Africans live their lives and do business? I think they are, especially after, after last year, you can imagine during the lockdown periods. And I'll probably give two examples of, uh, of application. One, let's, let, let's take the arguably the largest sector of the economy in most African countries, which is agriculture. So if you're a farmer who's um, looking to buy inputs during the planting season, and during the harvest season, you're looking to transport your output, right? If you're able to make that order online, especially even during COVID period where there's restrictions, that allows your supplier, assume it's an agri-tech company, to be able to aggregate not only your order, but those of the other farmers around you, which makes it more efficient in terms of when they're doing their logistics and transportation, they could probably uh, do the route mapping a lot better. On the output side, the same thing. Um, if, you're, if you're a buyer, large buyer um, on the agri-production space, it allows you to aggregate all your orders with this agri-tech and you tell them you go out to the to the farms i want x number of tons of products y right so that's one of them um the other one is um if you uh look at manufacturing for example let's say you're a manufacturing company you import um, a lot of your raw materials say from china they come through the port now as things are, or as things were traditionally, you probably have an entire department just tracking all that cargo. You know, where is it? Um, it literally tracking every container that comes in. Now, if you can aggregate all that and give all that work to Kagure, that takes, that saves you work and it saves you resources. And those resources can be applied to do something more productive. And, and, and Kagure then handles the headache of getting your containers from your port to, to your factory. So it is actually making a difference on the continent. It is actually uh, driving change. It's making the ecosystem more efficient and the value, the, the transport logistics value chain more efficient in addition to other value chains. So the entire manufacturing or even the agriculture value chain is becoming more efficient as a result of uh, the work being done by transport and logistics um, technology companies. Okay, um, thank you for that, Caesar. Um, we have another question on the chat, um, and this is actually to all panelists as well. Um, so how does the panel rate the success rate of Asian companies that have so far invested in Africa? Uh, Caesar, since you are, you know, <laughs> You're in my screen, so do you want to take it first? <laughs> How does the panel rate the success of Asian companies that have so far invested in Africa? Um, I'm assuming this is overall, not necessarily in transport and logistics. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we've, we've seen a lot in transport and logistics, but, but I think we've, um, the, 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 the rate of success will vary, but I think there's been success in uh, quite a number of them um, in different sectors. Uh, companies coming in from uh, from from China, from from uh, from Singapore, from India have set up shop here and actually been able to grow quite a bit, right? I think what we're missing is to see some of the ones in. Although maybe maybe Rafael is building that for us to see some of the ones in transport and logistics coming in, but some of them are also being locally built. Okay, um, Raphael, do you and Trish actually do you want to have any share your thoughts on this? Uh, in terms of purely investment, I don't think I, I'm not I'm not that knowledgeable. I mean, uh, uh, we have we have companies in other sector you know, that are from this region or even from Singapore, like Olam or or Tolaran, and they do you know they do like agriculture, they do logistics. They, uh, it depends. Uh, now, if we're really into the tech sector. I think Asia is still looking at uh, at Africa. Uh, we, we've seen like Didi coming to, to South Africa. So we, we start to see some interest from some ch Chinese company, uh, but I think we're really uh, at the beginning. Uh, and, and, and in our specific case, Gozem, we, we are people from Southeast Asia uh, that really understood that we, that Southeast Asia was the model, you know? And we really, we really believe so. That because when you look at Indonesia, you look at Vietnam, uh, those are the perfect country where you can learn the great models you can import. And you, don't, you don't need to go to look at the UK or the US or other countries. They're wrong. Uh, they don't, because startups always, are you solving a problem? No, it's always about solving a problem. If you're solving a real problem, you have a massive market you know, and you have potentially an amazing company behind. Uh, so that's where it starts. But yeah, uh, and on the investment part, to be honest, I'm not uh, knowledgeable enough. Uh, I guess Cesar is much more, or maybe others. From my side, I don't think I can speak to the Asian investment, but we have dealt with Asian companies as clients throughout the continent that have more than one office that are looking to expand their businesses. So I, I couldn't speak to that, that they are growing, but I can't speak to an investment and the success okay. of that. Um, so speaking directly on Asian companies, I think it has varied. When you look at uh, countries, uh, Asian countries such as um, Japan, China, India, they've done quite a lot of business in um, particularly Kenya, which is my home country, and I can speak a little bit more about that. And so um, the, the, the industry really varies um, in what they're invested in. Um, and of course, um, it varies on their own models and how they've been able to do. But some of these companies have been there for decades and they've been wildly successful. Um, so I think the, the opportunity is right there. When I think about transport logistics, you know, I was, I was driving around and I noticed, for example, Tata has gone big on what we call Buddha Buddha as the motorbike sector. They have massively invested in that sector. And so they're doing quite well there uh, when you, you know, so in the logistics sector, when I look at the tracking companies that we work with in terms of trucks, Chinese models have now for the first time overtaken uh, European models. Um, they are they are cheaper. They're reliable. They're setting up a base where they understand that I don't have to spend one fifty thousand dollars for a truck when I could get the same truck for seventy thousand dollars, and it gives me the same cash flow. So I think, generally speaking, it's building products that are meant for this market, understanding the situation, whether it's the road, the challenges on you know working capital, or even the challenges in ability to get loans or funding, as an example. So products that you develop or that you think about that are geared towards the mass market. And I think to what Rafael was saying, we are a market of great opportunity, but we're also a market where the margins are low. And so when you develop a product and the Asian companies that have developed products that really take this into account, have, they've done quite well. Okay. Um, I think we are more or less done with this. There's a question that came on the chat on how tracking is done um, through intermodal transportation. But I think Trish, you, you touched on this a bit. I don't know if you would want to add a bit more because the question is basically around, um, you know, how is intermodal transportation tracked between states uh, and which is actually preferred? Is it mainly road transportation or rail transportation and how does technology enhance the security of this uh, intermodal transportation? 
Yeah, with regards to vehicles, they can be tracked no matter where they're driving. So as long as we know that there's a unit in the vehicle, it's communicating with cell phone towers or technology, we're using that to track it on the platform. So yes, any vehicle, whether it's interstate or cross-border, it is able to be tracked. With regards to rail, we don't offer that service as yet. So for me, I'm speaking from a car tracking perspective, whether cross-border or interstate. Okay, and I think Kagura, you also mentioned the use of radio frequency as um, trucks move from state to state. So I think that also answers that question as well. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to end this very engaging panel. Thank you so much to our panelists, Trish, uh, Caesar, Raphael, and Kagura for sharing your perspectives as both operators and investors. And I certainly hope that all the participants that have, engaged, uh, have been listening in have found this conversation to be useful. So with that, I'd like to hand back over to Bridget. Yeah. Thanks so much, Chiku, and also to our really wonderful panelists uh, for taking on, I mean, firstly, sharing all of your insights and experience and also kind of engaging with our participants and also a special thank you to all our participants, especially those who have stayed on till the end, posting your questions, really appreciate it. Um, if you've got any further questions that um, you kind of didn't get a chance to post or you'd like to engage us within Enterprise Singapore directly, uh, we are going to kind of flash on our contact details uh, for email and feel free to kind of contact us directly. Um, and with that, this brings us to a close. So thank you all very much. Uh, final thing, we are going to host our Africa Singapore Business Forum in August this year via virtual. So do register your interests uh, kind of using the QR code that is flashed on the screen. Thank you all very much and have a good rest of the day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.